Chapter Ten Tames Goats. I cannot say that after this, for five years, any extraordinary thing happened to me, but I lived on in the same course, in the same posture and place as before. The chief things I was employed in, besides my yearly labour of planting my barley and rice, and curing my raisins, of both of which I always kept up just enough to have a sufficient stock of one year's provisions beforehand, I say, besides this yearly labour, and my daily pursuit of going out with my gun, I had one labour, to make a canoe, which at last I finished, so that, by digging a canal to it of six feet wide and four feet deep, I brought it into the creek, almost half a mile. As for the first, which was so vastly big, for I made it without considering beforehand, as I ought to have done, how I should be able to launch it, so, never being able to bring it into the water, or bring the water to it, I was obliged to let it lie where it was, as a memorandum to teach me to be wiser the next time. Indeed, the next time, though I could not get a tree proper for it, and was in a place where I could not get the water to it at any less distance than, as I have said, near half a mile, yet, as I saw it was practicable at last, I never gave it over, and though I was near two years about it, yet I never grudged my labour, in hopes of having a boat to go off to sea at last. However, though my little periagua was finished, yet the size of it was not at all answerable to the design which I had in view when I made the first, I mean, of venturing over to the terra firma, where it was above forty miles broad. Accordingly, the smallness of my boat assisted to put an end to that design, and now I thought no more of it. As I had a boat, my next design was to make a cruise round the island, for as I had been on the other side in one place, crossing, as I already described it, over the land, so the discoveries I made in that little journey made me very eager to see other parts of the coast, and now I had a boat, I thought of nothing but sailing round the island. For this purpose, that I might do everything with discretion and consideration, I fitted up a little mast in my boat, and made a sail, too, out of some of the pieces of the ship's sails which lay in store, and of which I had a great stock by me. Having fitted my mast and sail, and tried the boat, I found she would sail very well. Then I made little lockers or boxes at each end of my boat, to put provisions, necessaries, ammunition, etc., into, to be kept dry, either from rain or the spray of the sea, and a little long hollow place I cut in the inside of the boat, where I could lay my gun, making a flap to hang down over it to keep it dry. I fixed my umbrella also in the step at the stern, like a mast, to stand over my head, and keep the heat of the sun off me, like an awning, and thus I every now and then took a little voyage upon the sea, but never went far out, nor far from the little creek. At last, being eager to view the circumference of my little kingdom, I resolved upon my cruise, and accordingly I victualled my ship for the voyage, putting in two dozen of loaves, cakes I should call them, of barley bread, an earthen pot full of parched rice, a food I ate a good deal of, and a little bottle of rum, half a goat, and powder and shot for killing more, and two large watch-coats, of those which, as I mentioned before, I had saved out of the seamen's chests, these I took, one to lie upon, and the other to cover me in the night. It was the sixth of November, in the sixth year of my reign, or my captivity, which you please, that I set out on this voyage, and I found it much longer than I expected, for though the island itself was not very large, yet when I came to the east side of it, I found a great ledge of rocks lay out about two leagues into the sea, some above water, some under it, and beyond that a shoal of sand, lying dry half a league more, so that I was obliged to go a great way out to sea to double the point. When I first discovered them, I was going to give over my enterprise and come back again, not knowing how far it might oblige me to go out to sea, and above all, doubting how I should get back again. So I came to an anchor, for I had made a kind of an anchor with a piece of a broken grappling which I got out of the ship. Having secured my boat, I took my gun and went on shore climbing up a hill, which seemed to overlook that point where I saw the full extent of it, and resolved to venture. In my viewing the sea from that hill where I stood, I perceived a strong, and indeed a most furious current, 
which ran to the east, and even came close to the point, and I took the more notice of it because I saw there might be some danger, that when I came into it I might be carried out to sea by the strength of it, and not be able to make the island again, and indeed, had I not got first upon this hill, I believe it would have been so, for there was the same current on the other side of the island, only that it set off at a further distance, and I saw that there was a strong eddy under the shore, so I had nothing to do but to get out of the first current, and I should presently be in an eddy. I lay here, however, two days, because the wind blowing pretty fresh at east-south-east, and that being just contrary to the current, made a great breach of the sea upon the point, so that it was not safe for me to keep too close to the shore for the breach, nor to go too far off, because of the stream. The third day, in the morning, the wind having abated overnight, the sea was calm, and I ventured. But I am a warning to all rash and ignorant pilots, for no sooner was I come to the point, when I was not even my boat's length from the shore, but I found myself in a great depth of water, and a current like the sluice of a mill. It carried my boat along with it with such violence, that all I could do could not keep her so much as on the edge of it. But I found it hurried me farther and farther out from the eddy, which was on my left hand. There was no wind stirring to help me, and all I could do with my paddles signified nothing, and now I began to give myself over for lost, for as the current was on both sides of the island, I knew in a few leagues' distance they must join again, and then I was irrecoverably gone, nor did I see any possibility of avoiding it, so that I had no prospect before me but of perishing, not by the sea, for that was calm enough, but of starving from hunger. I had, indeed, found a tortoise on the shore, as big almost as I could lift, and had tossed it into the boat, and I had a great jar of fresh water, that is to say, one of my earthen pots, but what was all this to being driven into the vast ocean, where, to be sure, there was no shore, no mainland or island, for a thousand leagues at least? And now I saw how easy it was for the providence of God to make even the most miserable condition of mankind worse. Now I looked back upon my desolate, solitary island as the most pleasant place in the world, and all the happiness that my heart could wish for was to be but there again. I stretched out my hands to it, with eager wishes. "'O oh, happy desert!' said I. "'I shall never see thee more. O oh, miserable creature! Whither am I going?' Then I reproached myself with my unthankful temper, and that I had repined at my solitary condition, and now what would I give to be on shore there again? Thus we never see the true state of our condition till it is illustrated to us by its contraries, nor know how to value what we enjoy but by the want of it. It is scarcely possible to imagine the consternation I was now in, being driven from my beloved island, for so it appeared to me now to be, into the wide ocean, almost two leagues, and in the utmost despair of ever recovering it again. However, I worked hard till, indeed my strength was almost exhausted, and kept my boat as much to the northward, that is, towards the side of the current which the eddy lay on, as possibly I could, when about noon, as the sun passed the meridian, I thought I felt a little breeze of wind in my face, springing up from south-south-east. This cheered my heart a little, and especially when, in about half an hour more, it blew a pretty gentle gale. By this time I had got at a frightful distance from the island, and had the least cloudy or hazy weather intervene, I had been undone another way, too, for I had no compass on board, and should never have known how to have steered toward the island, if I had but once lost sight of it but the weather continuing clear, I applied myself to get up my mast again, and spread my sail, standing away to the north as much as possible, to get out of the current. 